Hello, John Terrell of Cultic Cube here. Pull a chair up to the fireside at Chateau Cube, where we discuss life, limited magic, and cube draft. I am delighted to be joined today by Andrew Magrini. Andrew is not only a pillar of the New York City cube scene, but he is a fixture at GPs and magic fests around the world. He is known for his love of casual magic formats, such as EDH, and he marries that ethos to his cube design in charming and surprising ways. In the first half of our conversation, Andrew and I discuss his powered cube environment, which is striking for supporting strategies and combos that we might not typically associate with Vintage Cube. In the latter part of our chat, we move on to Andrew's latest project, which he flattered me by asking me to consult on in its early stages, the Arch Enemy Cube. He ports the three-on-one Arch Enemy game mode, complete with a devious scheme deck, to a draft environment. We pick up the conversation as Andrew describes why he prefers to concierge the play experience for others, rather than make a draft session about his own aims and ego. I am delighted to welcome Andrew to Chateau Cube. My brain thinks of it as I've spent countless hours and dollars to like make this thing. And the last thing I want to do is to essentially torpedo the draft by inserting oh, myself no. in it. And thus, oh, like, that's silly. ruining the, the feedback from others because it's like, oh, I'm just going to keep snagging all the green cards, good, bad, and different, and just like, but, you know, I know that's obviously, it's a, it's a, an exaggeration because, like, I would rather, like, especially at big events when you got folks from all over town, like, all over the country and stuff, like, in for events, I'd rather give them the chance because, like, in better circumstances, you know, like any given weekday, we can we could fire a cube pretty easily. You know, that's why I'd rather, especially you know, like when I bring it to big events, it's like any excuse to just like put insert somebody else. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally see that. I really enjoy taking a seat to one side and watching how other people interact with the cube as well, and it gives totally different insight when one's not right there in the trenches. It's hard to concentrate on both drafting and doing what I'm trying to do and also see what other people are doing. Also, being at some remove allows one to kind of wander around the table. And- yeah, and, and at events, if you're drafting in the hall, like being able to walk around and schmooze, like obviously, you know, if you have a, a fairly high priced cube, you know, you don't want to really let it out of your sight, but like you're afforded the opportunity to be more mobile and not just fixed to the seat, which I think is the big thing. Yeah, that's true. It can also lower the stress for the people involved in cubing because sometimes I feel, especially when I'm cubing with people who aren't as familiar with me or the environment, it may create some anxiety for the cube curator to be right there drafting next to them. And they may feel that they're at a disadvantage or something, which, you know, maybe they are. I, I know the cube better than they do, <laughs> no yeah, doubt about true. that. But, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. That talking about torpedo in your own cube that's that's just <laughs> that's just crazy that's crazy talk and draft is a self-correcting format anyway of, of course you yeah. know so if you're sitting there taking all the green cards people have got to figure out what they're supposed to be doing then and account for that green shut off so just pass all the green along to andrew was green an example just sort of taken at random or are you more likely than not to sit down and start forcing green no i think it's pretty much the open color like i'll just i'll just like pivot as hard as humanly possible we we interact with so many like galaxy brained folks who are able to be like oh well if i take this and this wheels i can pull you know i can composite this pile of cards whereas for me it's really just like read the table and just kind of like, I'm pretty straightforward, especially in an environment that I'm not familiar with. Like there's a very famous story of me and traveling to GP Minneapolis, I believe in 2018. What should have been a pretty straightforward flight to, to Minnesota uh, ended up being over 12, like the, the whole um, getting on the plane took over 12 hours. Getting on the plane? You were just sitting in the airport for 12 hours? 
uh, I had a flight out of LaGuardia. So obviously, if you know, like New York has several major uh, flight hubs uh, in the immediate area, two in the city and one right in Jersey and Newark. My initial flight was out of my normal one, which is which is LaGuardia. The flight was canceled. Uh, what was it? The the next flight then was actually out of JFK, and that was at eight o'clock. And so this was originally a one p.m. flight. We're now at eight p.m. sitting in JFK, and the flight got pushed to nine o'clock, and then it got pushed to one a.m. Eastern. Oh my gosh! And so I said, you know what? Whatever, I'm making this happen. Uh, I got in at. Uh, I think 4.30 Central, and we were starting the Cube uh, draft at a microbrewery in downtown Minnesota at, I think, 7 Central Sharp. And so I crashed. I snuck into the house, Mike's house. I snuck into the house because the dogs were upstairs and I didn't want them barking. I crashed on the couch and basically power napped. Uh I showed up with him at the draft event. I basically pounded a box of Joe from Duncan. And I ended up being the, f- it was a rotisserie cube. And uh, so everything's laid out. Everybody has full information of the draft. And uh, I was first. So I actually got two picks. And I said to myself, like, my brain is not functioning. So I literally went goblin guide, lightning bolt. And I just said to everyone, get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I do not have any semblance of thought right now. Yeah. You're fueled by coffee and hatred and a burning fire. Yeah, breakfast sandwiches. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, man, like, let's let's go. And it was an amazing weekend. Wow. And a microbrewery opened at seven in the morning. My goodness. Well, they just yeah. So what they did. So it was the, the, the brewery itself wasn't open. It was just more usage of the table space. And so they mm-hmm. basically just like let us use the tables while they were getting things set up for whatever their typical opening time was. Yeah, and then the last time we were there, we 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 did a draft in an art gallery, and so like that's why I say like for folks, if if you're interested in cubing at like the peak of like the experience, I always advise going to GP Minneapolis because like the 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 crew out there is just so tight and so good. The experience every single time has just been so outstanding that. I, I make it a marked point every year to figure out when that is and book accordingly. Nice. That sounds great. How would you like to do the little game whereby we roll some dice and arrive at a card? You want to roll for color or CMC? What, what, I'll, I'll, I'll do CMC. How's that? One. All right. Okay. I've got a three. So that's black. So black ones. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to say, you know, for the purposes of discussion, and I think it kind of sets the tenor for, you know, the conversation we're having this evening, but I'm going to say Booster Tutor. On one hand, it's it's a, a thumb in the nose or a thumb to the nose to my my, my good friend and fellow New Yorker, uh, Ryan Sachs. So shout out to Ryan, um, because like <laughs> him and I, we always go back and forth on like, I'm going to include these cards in my queue because X and Ryan's like, well, that card doesn't exist. So like. Uh, I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. Um, if it has a silver border, it doesn't exist. Exactly. No, I think for me, it's just like there's there's something inherently fun when you do something that's outside of the norms or the the conceived traditions of cube, a cubed environment. You know, I try to balance that aspect of broken and really like tight gameplay with just sheer jankiness. And I feel like that's one of those where it's like, sure, I'm going to give you a black instant tutor for one, but it's not going to be something that you picked before. And like, that's like the fun trade off of of that card. Would you read us the card for those at home who may not be familiar with it? Sure. Booster Tutor is from uh, it's from a couple of unsets now because it was most recently printed in unsanctioned, but it is a black instant for one black pip. And it reads, open a sealed magic booster pack, reveal the cards and put one of them into your hand. Remove that card from your deck before beginning a new game. And it has really great flavor text. You save that Urza's Saga pack all these years for this? <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, that is a super sweet card and a, a really interesting card and one that is a fun roll of the dice. I definitely know a lot of people who cube that card, or I don't know about a lot, but some who cube it and who will run, you know, they'll be at a 360 cube and they'll run an extra 15 cards for the pack. 
I've heard of people who will compose the pack in some way, like they'll put one of each color card in there. Like they'll try to make it equitable, I guess, in some way rather than doing it at random, or they'll put in two of each color. I don't know. Like they have some way of divvying things up. This is also maybe the kind of person who composes their packs generally and weaves X number of white cards and Y number of blue cards and so on into each pack to make things more fair or more evenly distributed. I don't know about more fair. I've, I've never messed with that. I just I just shuffle up the cube and make packs. Yep. Hope hope to God that like you shuffle it enough so that person who, who put that really sick blue-black deck together doesn't show up across just three packs or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It is kind of fun, though, when that when that happens, I, I guess, in its own way, when you can see like echoes of drafts past coming up somehow. I mean, that's not like ideal, but it's kind of cool. I mean, it's part of the fun if you end up with an unusual number of red cards in the pool that people are drafting. It, it's variance. It makes the experience different. That's cool. That's a neat card. I'm not super high on the uncards that do like extraordinarily wacky stuff. Booster tutors like pretty wacky but then also like not not that wacky it's the kind of wackiness that is palatable to me yeah no there's there's certainly there's a there's a sliding scale in terms of like appropriateness versus like what are you doing here and like you know that certainly sits yeah to your point that sits on a a, a certain level we can we can we can get into some of the other uh the options uh in a bit but like i have a couple uh, across both of the cubes I'm, you know, kind of running with and, you know, some have certainly produced some really hysterical results. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. All right. Well we'll have to we'll have to talk about those. Well here, let me I'll do my black one drop and then we'll move on to your cubes. So I want to call attention to Crypt Breaker. So this guy, he costs a black mana pip. He's from um Eldritch Moon. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, let me see. I'll just read the card. So he's a zombie. He's a 1-1. And he's got an activated ability, one and a black, tap, discard a card, put a 2-2 black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. And then also he says, tap three untapped zombies you control. You draw a card and you lose one life. I think this guy's kind of sweet. He's got a lot of utility. So... Probably for me, the most important thing he does is he's a discard outlet for reanimator strategies. So that's kind of like my level zero for how I evaluate the guy. He's good at pitching cards and pretty fast because you can play him on turn one and then on turn two, pitch something and, you know, get some additional value off of that by getting the zombie token. Also in black aggro strategies, I wouldn't call this guy like a premier black one drop for black aggro. But nevertheless, he's a good late game. Well, not, not, I mean, he does he does things, right, as the game progresses. And if you hit a board stall, he can start pitching swamps and turning them into two twos and that kind of thing. And he draws you cards. And of course, he can tap himself. So you only need two more zombies to start using this guy to draw cards. That's kind of sweet. Yeah, I don't know like the 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 typical count for, you know, the number of zombies you typically have in a base cube, but like the likelihood of even hitting that second activated ability just on the basis of like the composition of black in your cube, you know, there's a likelihood. You know, like I'm looking I'm just looking at my list, you know, I have Diagraph Ghoul, I have Carrion Feeder, you know, Carnophage. If you're pushing the aggro strategy and less the reanimator strategy where the discard plays a factor, that mid-range slog, you, you need something to help generate advantage in some way. So having creatures that can do stuff in lieu of just turning sideways, I think is a you know a big leg up in those kinds of scenarios. That's totally true. Right. There's a number of aggro one drops that are zombies, of course. Diagraph Ghoul, you, you mentioned. Dread Wanderer. What else? Grave Crawler, of course. A good, one of these good recursive black one drops. You got Raging, uh, Rotting Regisaur, yeah, yeah. you know, my list. Yeah. You got Vindictive Lich in my list, um, though I had some back and forth recently on, you know, whether, you know, whether that's still a, like a viable avenue um, in my list versus like some new options. Something you're doing a fine job pointing out here is that you don't have to bend over backwards to shove zombies into the cube in order to turn this guy on. You've probably naturally got some number of zombies, not like humans necessarily, but more than 
I don't know, minotaurs or something, right? <laughs> yeah. They're just going to kind of be there. And this dude makes zombies, obviously. So that's a cool guy. Do you run this guy in any of your cubes? I believe I did before in my powered list. Uh, I think I've since shifted, you know, just focus on like X1, looking at Diagraph Ghoul. Like I have Carrion Feeder, but that's more of a sack outlet. Um, Blood Soak Champion. Tell us about your um, powered cube and some of, how would you describe it? What are some of the features of it? So the background with this cube, and, you know, it pl- it lends to a bit of my philosophy for how I like to play Magic in general. You know, before really getting into the cube scene, you know, I've been uh, a commander player for many years. You know, a lot of the tenants of that play environment um, and play patterns are fun to me. I had a rare opportunity back in 2015 from a, a friend of mine on Twitter to actually purchase a uh, essentially a full set of collector's edition for a, you know, at the time was was a good amount of money, but now is like a joke compared to how things are, <laughs> how prices have skyrocketed in the, like the last year or so. You know, I have my my friend Preston here in the city, and he had a a, um, a cube, and he would uh, hold cubes fairly regularly. And so he had his like you know super well thought out. You had to be very polished and have a, a strong draft IQ to to really like get the most out of it. And for me, it was like you know I got this collector's edition set, and I said to myself like I could be the powered cube in this environment. So that's kind of where you know, this started was, you know, building this on the, at the cross of the two axes of a having a powered list, which was unique for the scene and also lending itself to my commander based sensibilities on big splashy gameplay and really swingy, like, you know, any, you know, top deck madness kind of stuff. Uh, the, The learning curve for being like that cube designer on paper versus like it actually coming to fruition in a live draft environment that that took a while for it to be fully realized. And I also want to I want to stress for friends at home that I am gesticulating wildly with my hands. (laughs) And it's very sad that you can't see it. But I just want I want you to know that, you know, our friends at the Chateau are, are getting a full on display of just how Italian I really am. You've got very expressive hands, Andrew. <laughs> it's moving. Andrew's holding them in a, in a gesture of prayer at the moment. now. <laughs> supplication. Supplication. That's 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 the word. You know, that'll be my word of the night. Yeah. Supplication. Yeah. So so that was kind of like the the start of this cube. It took quite a while for me to actually like hammer this thing into shape. I remember the first cube draft, my friend Preston, who had been mentioned before, uh, was very kind to host at his office my first draft. And there weren't enough islands. There were two regrowths in the list. So folks were really confused because I think that's like one of the secret things about cube is that you learn to become, you become organized play for the evening, like how you facilitate Uh pairings like setting up packs, shuffling it, like you, you get a first hand in terms of like hospitality and like the overall experience. So like, you know, getting from that stage now, you know, so we have, you know, the sensibilities and like where I'm coming from to like, you know, actually making this like a draftable cube versus a pile of garbage, like that took time. As this list evolved, it became really a really interesting back and forth because you have the expectations of folks coming to sit down to draft a powered cube and then you have me and you have my sensibilities and when if i when i sit down at this cube like what the are the things that i would like to be doing as a part of it you're talking about some conflict between the fact of it being a powered environment and your own sensibilities that you're describing well which you're glossing as interest and jankiness and so on which is awesome do you think, though, that if you took power out of the equation, your relationship to the cube or your concerns about how people might approach the cube would be substantially different? I mean, probably. I think there's such a there is such a jump from when you say, oh, I have a cube to, oh, I have a powered cube that suddenly the, you know, the, 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 the flashing lights go off that it's like we're going to play some broken magic, folks. And. That is 100% true, but there's also like the baggage of like the expectations of like what that is. 
you know, something that we discussed kind of offhand is like another axis of this that I've been tried to instill in folks, you know, over over time and over the internet is like, you know, a third a third situation in that narrative. So it's like I have a cube. You know, there's exp- you know, there's there's preconceptions number one. Um, which is a lot of unknowns. There's, I have a powered cube, which brings up a whole new set of expectations, um, guesstimations on like what the experience is like. And the third piece, which is kind of interesting because it involves, you know, a fair bit of like self-promotion branding and like just, just general talk. It's the idea that I have a powered cube. Uh huh. Andrew McGreeny. I, Andrew McGreeny, the master of jank and total insanity have a powered cube. And that should, in and of itself, hopefully, instill an entire different set of expectations in terms of what that experience will be like. For for folks at home, you know, who who know me online, like, you know, that's a big reason why, like, just doing, you know, daily pack one, pick ones, like just exposing people to the cards in this cube, because there are so many times you'll see, like, I think the one I did literally today or yesterday was recurring nightmare versus opposition. You're going to get people that are going to, you know, debate the tenets of which deck or which archetype is more broken fundamentally utilizing those cards. Recurring nightmare. <laughs> let the record let the record state that recurring nightmare <laughs> is in fact the word broken card. I have voiced my opinion. <laughs> exactly. But then you get another pack one pick one, you might get, you know, maybe opposition Maybe a fetch, got to focus. Fetch. <laughs> <laughs> but you also might get uh, Sarah Sanctum. You know, you'll see it. You'll get people that are like snap keep going for the fetch or snap keep going for the opposition. But you'll get that handful of people that are going to sit there and be like, I know what I'm in for. And I am snapping that Sarah Sanctum because that is going to be top shelf play. That's going to be a top shelf draft experience. That's going to be a top shelf, maybe play experience. Read us Sarah Sanctum, if you would, because as you say, that's, uh, you know, when we're talking powered cubes, people probably know opposition and recurring nightmare and so on. But maybe Sarah Sanctum is a less familiar one to them. With pleasure. So Sarah Sanctum is uh, an Urza block uh, legendary land. Um, it is it is of the ilk of your Telerian Academies um, and Gaia's Cradles. Um, but Sarah Sanctum specifically focuses on enchantments and reads, tap, add white mana to your mana pool for each enchantment you control. And so this is a, again, it's in the same cycle as your Gaia's Cradles, which focuses on creatures, and your Telerian Academies, which focus on artifacts. But this grants you more mana for having enchantments on the battlefield. It sends off some very strange alarm bells for folks when they crack a pack and suddenly you see a very high density of enchantments in a powered list. You're going to see some inventive ads to better support those archetypes. And you're going to see some increased redundancies in certain spaces and places that you may not expect. But because of how over a very long you know, trajectory, you know, this cube has been tailored to make all of these competitive to some extent. It's not taking into consideration the delta between you know, folks who have a very high draft IQ who can, you know, essentially read the tea leaves of, of the cube picks to, like, build the best possible deck, but also, like, you know, speaking to those who might stick to, you know, the parameters of, like, the gold signal post cards and, like, see, like, oh, I understand what this archetype is, so I'm going to draft to build that, for instance. Well, do you think that supporting archetypes... Supporting archetypes in particular that may be less familiar or less expected to people is something that helps players who may be new to the environment or have a lower draft IQ, as you describe it. Do you feel like having a Sarah Sanctum gives people something to like grab onto and sort of know what they're doing and design a draft around it? You know, Cube is a challenge for anyone who, who doesn't know the list. And so I think it really strips you back to your knowledge of the game and like the interactions on a per card basis. So like if you don't know the cube explicitly, then you're going to have to rely on your knowledge of the individual cards in that cube to know, oh, this does this and this does this. Um, And then stepping even further back when you have someone who may have never even cubed before in their lives 
how can you flatten the delta between like their draft experience and how they play versus someone who may have a number of drafts under their belt and may have you know full information of the cube itself that's been i want to say the the latest exercise in this powered list is finding ways to decrease that that delta between the two um, experiences not to the detriment of the cube overall and so it's finding optimizations or at least hypotheses for optimizations that i think can kind of you know curtail that higher end you know like i'll give you a very good example you know we're drafting this cube at pax unplugged probably about two years ago and you know i have some very good friends of mine from New York. So shout out to Anthony and Miles. Very, very good, very, very smart magic players and very good drafters. Watching them draft versus a few folks at the other end of the table who had never cubed a day in their lives and so are literally reading every single card in a pack because they don't know what any of it does was fascinating. You know, being able to walk around the table and kind of watch how they're drafting and how they are processing, you know, because I saw those newer players gravitated really strongly towards the defined archetypes and the the gold signal posts in those respective colors, whereas you had the Anthonys and the Miles going for the broken cards and finding ways of constructing these utterly delightful yet terrifying abominations. When they faced off against each other, it was some hardcore vintage magic. And then you go to the other side of the table and you have a black red aristocrats deck, which looks pretty perfect versus like the true enchantress deck that I envision for this list. Like in that scenario, like game one went to uh, aristocrats with like a combo finish off of blood artist and like a carrion feeder kind of setup. And then the other game was Enchantress getting off to a fast start, as fast as I guess Enchantress can get, and dropping a ghostly prison and following up with an Armageddon and just basically watching the other player just get locked out of any sort of aggression. That's something that I want to do. <laughs> so, so seeing that disparity in how the draft and subsequently the games went is where my brain started to go in terms of like, how can I responsibly bring those broke vintage decks down a peg to give more breathing room to the defined archetypes? And so like, you know, I used to run the the full set of signets. And I think that was, you know, that was where I focused my energy. And I said to myself, you know, what are the colors that can benefit from signets and or talismans for me that was jeskai because you have blue white flicker you have blue red which is kind of the defined i would say the defined archetype for artifacts even though there is like a kind of a mono brown list if you can get it and then red white which is like super aggro but like between these colors you have a lot of the components for artifacts as well as like upheaval and wildfires And so, you know, I made the decision to cut most of the signets and just keep in Jeskai colored signets as well as the Jeskai talismans. It continues to give green its identity as, you know, a ramp color, big, chonky top end finishers. But then you give the opportunity for some of these other archetypes uh, a chance to thrive, albeit a bit more far fetched. Yeah, right. That seems like a good approach to tackling the signets and the talismans and so on. That's something I've wrestled with as well. I'm sure all cube designers have. I've got exactly, is it talisman? You know, the is it colored talisman, whatever it's called, dominance or something. I think that's uh, it's creativity. Creativity. Yeah, right. So I've got that one. And none of the other signets are talismans because like you, I've got, I mean, it's in blue and red that artifacts sort of resides. And I just kept cutting back and cutting back on those two mana uh, mana rocks because I did feel like they were kind of squeezing green too much from where it should really shine with its dorks. I think it's tough. I can totally see what you're saying about wrestling with how viable archetypes like aristocrats or blink are in the context of a powered environment where you can be doing really busted vintage things. 
just today on Twitter, I think it was Aryan Ang, um, I'm butchering his name, I'm sure, but who's involved in um, the Cube Vitational with Thomas Krohn in the Netherlands, was asking about aristocrats and its viability in a high-powered environment. I think you saw this, didn't you? Did you weigh in on this or you like liked something on I'd it? I probably liked something. I don't know. I probably liked something <laughs> on it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we were having this conversation on Twitter just today and I was opining there that I think it's extraordinarily difficult in a high powered environment to make aristocrats work. So good on you for, for doing that work and trying to make that happen. So do you still have aristocrats, for example, in your high powered cube? And if so, what are some moves that you've made to make it be able to run with the maybe the bigger dogs, at least if you agree that they are bigger dogs, you know? Yeah, no, I, it's, it's, yeah, it's certainly a challenge, um, especially because you have so many good cards in your, you know, your Rakdos colors, Duretti, Ingenious Iconoclast, you know, you have Colagon's Command. What I have in my list that speaks specifically to aristocrats as an archetype. You know, I have Judith, the Scourge Diva. Um, so so for, for folks, that is a, a Rakdos card. So it costs one, a black and a red uh, for a 2-2 two, two human shaman uh, that reads uh, other creatures you control get plus one, plus oh. It's a little bit of an aggro boost. Um, but then the second line of text is pertinent. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies, Judith, the Scourge Diva, deals one damage to any target. You get essentially, you know, a three mana uh, boost for attacks, or at least power, um, as well as, you know, text that is reminiscent of your Zillapart Cutthroats or your Blood Artists. Additionally, I have Falconrath Aristocrat, which is like a staple, you know, like the staple top end for this archetype. Aristocrats. I mean, it's, it's in the <laughs> name. Like, I mean, come on. She's one of the you namesake know. aristocrats along with cartel aristocrat. Right? Here I am trying to explain away when it's literally in the name, like why... <laughs> why the card is important. <laughs> so like, you know, stat all yeah, comments. No, but people may not people may not know the history. I mean, this was an actual deck, a standard deck in Return to Ravnica era back in 2013 or something, I guess. Yeah. Somewhere along those lines. There's another card in in this. I have it as Rakdos, but it could go black or it could go red. Um, and it speaks to how I've tried to inject a bit more I don't want to say consistency for combos, but what I think really speaks to this card being in here is that it allows you to potentially pull from other colors or other cards that you may not be associating, and that is uh, Murderous Red Cap. And so Murderous Red Cap is a 2-2 Goblin Assassin for two and two hybrid black-red mana. It says when Murderous Red Cap enters the battlefield, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. And the important line that's here is that it has persist. And so the rules text there for, for folks who don't know is that when this creature dies, if it had no minus one, minus one counters on it, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a minus one, minus one counter on it. What I've done is I've really aimed to incorporate consistency for parasitic archetypes. And one of those is persist combo. That has legs in green, white, with some creatures, um, but it also has red cap, for instance. And essentially, you know, what I'm trying to do here um, in the be for the benefit of, you know, this Rakdos archetype is essentially building redundancy in ways that may not be initially designed for. So if you get a murderous red cap, a sack outlet, and a metallic mimic, for instance, like you now have a Rakdos flavored combo engine like ready to roll yeah so metallic mimic lets you name a creature type and then any creature who enters the battlefield who's of that type enters with a plus one plus one counter on it so then the point is when your guy dies he'll persist and come back he'll get the plus one plus one counter which will like negate the minus one minus one counter or whatever and then you can kill him again and he'll come back again and it's awesome it's rinse repeat it's like i'm dead no i'm not but wait i'm dead but no i'm not yeah, um, just keep sacking the guy. So, and there's so like speaking to Rakdos specifically, it's actually really interesting. So we talked about 
you know, increasing the increasing the redundancy of the combo there as a, as a potential avenue for builders. The other side of this equation is essentially that shift in black white in your Orzov colors um, from you know a more staxy kind of environment to humans now means that you have potential options on that side of the fence because uh, for instance Judith is a human I'm not sure like whether people know that or not but it's like there's an op- there's an opportunity now to incorporate components of you know that side of the color pie to to kind of build you know if not redundancy just like presence you know you also get in white you get safe hold delete which i have as a white creature in here so that's another another persist enabler uh you know a 2 2 that is one in green or white hybrid um so that kind of fits in that space as well but essentially just like being able to incorporate synergy between different archetypes so it's like you know when you think aristocrats you're not just in black cards red cards and maybe some artifacts like you now have a wider palette to choose from to potentially like flesh that deck out because like the overlap there that i think is really interesting is metallic mimic so on one hand you have a persist enabler but then speaking to that new humans archetype in black and white you have another lord potentially you have this synergistic opportunity to for for a single card to kind of have multiple roles in in the draft which is great for me because i'm looking at such disparate archetypes that don't necessarily have overlap between one another like those kinds of things are things that i will grab for and certainly test to see if it's viable I used to have a um, sort of modern-ish powered cube that I basically tore apart a few years ago now. Um, But I supported Aristocrats there, and its home was in black-red, but I supported it broadly in the Aristocrats colors, which is to say the uh, black, red, and white Mardu. I tried to do something similar to what you're describing. I didn't have any outs to persist combo, but I wanted aristocrats to overlap with other things. So in white and red in particular, you could go hard into tokens. And I also ran like intangible virtue, for instance, which is that two mana anthem for tokens, you know, and then obviously lots of white token makers. And then things like Goblin Trenches in Boros that lets you sack land. You can sack a land and make two one one goblin tokens. And Goblin Bombardment in red, which is just a sack outlet and it throws damage around, lets you ping things. But anyway, you could shear into tokens as well. And then like incidentally have an Aristocrats thing. There are lots of different ways that you could build the deck where you could have a sort of primary focus within this constellation of colors, but then have like incidental value elsewhere. You could be principally Aristocrats with a lot of tokens and just have an intangible virtue. And for this reason, Judith makes me like a little bit sad because I think Judith is a very good card. I mean, I think she's a very good card, but like that non-token thing, oh, it just kills me. Yeah. The fact that she doesn't get to deal her damage on the death of a token. Right. It kind of makes it like, it puts a real cap on like realistically, like how much output she's going to have. Now that obviously that output grows infinitely when you have something like murderous red cap. Yeah, and Black has all of those recursive creatures, obviously. I mean, we talked about Gravecrawler and so on earlier. There's plenty of effects like that, including at one, right? Well, all of these aggressive Black one drops that you can keep sacking and returning, not to mention the skeletons and so on. It's it's funny with this cube. I feel I feel like I'm in a pretty a pretty happy place. Like I'm sure there's probably some cuts and some swaps. Um, I think with the most recent couple of sets i think the one thing i'm most excited about is going to be pathways um so i'm going to find room for those because i was testing uh, a few of the eldraine lands so like castle embereth castle garenbrig castle castle ardenvale um so i think some of those are going to easily get swapped out um, along with some of the perhaps subpar duels i'm running so like for instance in blue green is the only colors i'm running uh, a temple, so a temple of mystery. And so I feel like that's probably an easy cut in favor of whatever the pathways name is for Simic colors. But like, 
you know, just like being able to increase the the consistency of the play uh, for these decks obviously is another opportunity to, you know, minimize, you know, the delta between play and draft experiences for newer versus more experienced players. The pathways, they're super cool. I'm excited about those too. They're sort of dual lands, but you pick a side. They're MDFC, so you pick either a, you know, if it's a blue-red duel, then you pick whether you play it on the blue side or on the red side. And they don't have the basic land types, right? So you can't fetch them up, but they enter untapped, which obviously is a huge deal. They're exactly what you need them to be at the time you need them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about those things. I really wish Watsi would finish that gosh darn Amonkhet cycle of cycling. Oh, I want them so bad. You know, I think, you know, maybe this is maybe this is the year for it. You know, I'll look to my my friends at Watsi, hopefully. I would be remiss if I didn't go a night or a podcast without screaming Mishra one time for my my dearest friend. (laughs) Gavin um, and his lack of designing a new Mishra creature card uh, for dear old me, but uh, you know I have to <laughs> I have to get it in there once, so I did it. I got my I got my box ticked. I can I can sign off happy now. <laughs> what would you have of your Mishra? Tell me about Andrew's ideal Mishra. It, there's such a rich story for the brothers. You know, when you read the Brothers War and you look at you know what they went through. You know, we got a flavor to some extent with Traxo's Scourge of Krug. Funny enough, I could pull it up right here because that is in my powered cube. Nice. Traxo's Scourge of Krug is a 7-7 uh, a legendary artifact creature construct. It costs four mana. It's a 7-7 seven, seven trample. Uh, it enters the battlefield tapped and doesn't untap during your untap step. Uh, whenever you cast a historic spell, which is an artifact, a legendary, or a saga, um, you can untap Traxos. So, you know, speaking from lore, Traxos is one of the dragon engines Mishra designed after having found the initial trio of dragon engines uh, that were Phyrexian in nature. And those were at his command. Uh, and I'm probably getting this wrong, so I'm sure Avorthos uh, is going to come at me with like a knife on the street or something. But, um, <laughs> you know, his, his use of the weak stone is what drew them to him. And so, like, being able to see a Mishra, similar to how we saw Urza creating one of his golems, because that was, you know, between ornithopters and, you know, uh, golem constructs, um, that's what he built on his side of the war versus Mishra with these monstrosities that were, you know, essentially simulacra of these Phyrexian dragon engines he found. So if we got a Mishra that, similar to Urza, produced a, you know, a Traxos-like token, like that in and of itself would be just sweet from a flavor perspective. Gavin, if you hear this, you know, you could always confide in me and you can... <laughs> We can work together on that or, you know, maybe even a Tokazia card um, who was the uh, instructor for young Mishra and Urza uh, in the early years prior to the the, the Brothers War. So um, I'm more than happy to to consult on that stuff. (laughs) Nice. That's great. And then we can all call the card, call the Mishra Andrew. Yes. Or... We'll call we'll call know, the the the, like the dragon engine will be named Andrew because I don't think the originals actually had names, uh, so we can we can we can retcon one of the dragon engines to be called Andrew in some. Yeah, it should be Andrew, right? It's <laughs> your in. It'll be your invitational card, <laughs> like a Bob or a Tiago or a John or a Jens or whatever. Actually, I do have as a funny digression. Um, you know, we talked about owning like magic art and magic adjacent paraphernalia i actually own the monotype for victor adam minguez's uh karnstruck token victor was in the united states at the time uh heading up to hascon he stopped in new york on his way to rhode island because he said to me he said i'd never been to new york city before and i said oh well now we just gotta stomp the gas and so you know he showed up during my lunch hour and i took him up to um you know i i worked right by grand central in midtown you know about 10 blocks north of uh, my office is uh, is the original pj clark's which is a very you know like it's a franchise name but like the original is actually a new york institution for decent to very good burgers 
I treated him to to lunch and we got we went the full gamut like we had bison burgers and like you know New York cheesecake because like you're in New York way too many drinks um especially on my lunch hour which was really kind of funny it was a three burger lunch and a three martini lunch yeah oh, i was i mean it was both yeah <laughs> um and uh i want to say you know so that was that was uh, leading into Hascon was September of 2017. And then just before March of 18, which I think was GP Hartford in Connecticut, um, he reached out and he said to me, you know, uh, you know, I want to thank you. And he said, if, if there was a print of a single card that I've done, uh, what would you want? And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, I mean, I, I have my art collection is pretty much all artifact or machinery based. Like I love artifacts. Okay, um, that's awesome. So it's actually uh, the the collection is called in air quotes. It's called bots and baubles. And uh, I, you know, so like when I, I'm saying to myself, like, what would I want? That's really cool. And I said, you know, I, I would really. You have all these wonderful cards, um, like a Traxa and all this stuff. Uh, I said I would actually really just love to get uh, a print of your 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 construct token. He said to me, he said, well, you're in luck because I only have one. You know, I never, I didn't actually decide to ever get that one done in a print run to actually sell. And so when I showed up at GP Hartford, he surprised me and signed it pretty much one of one with a thank you note on the back. <laughs> uh, and I have that framed yeah. in my, the foyer of uh, the front of my apartment. That's why, like, for me, it's That's like, super I, cool. I want to make sure I have cards in here that produce. So like you know, Urza, you know, Karn, Scion, you know, it's like just making sure I have all of the requisite cards that actually make that exact card because it gives me like a, a fun story to tell. Right. And then you've got such a personal connection to this piece of art that involves the artist, you know, and this good time that you had together. We pause to recognize a charitable organization singled out by Andrew. Next for Autism. Next for Autism addresses the needs of people with autism and their families by creating and supporting educational, clinical, and vocational programs. Its aim is less to support advocacy or scientific research, but instead to impact the lives of those with autism directly and through its work to promote cultural shifts in the approach to autism services. I am donating all of my ad revenue since my last podcast to Next for Autism. Learn more at nextforautism.org. Well, you have a new project. This is the Arch Enemy Cube. So yeah, tell it, tell us all about this thing. And and actually, if you would, start by explaining Arch Enemy as a mode of gameplay, because this is something that not everybody may be familiar with. Yeah, I think I would I would go as far to say that most people don't have a clue um, how <laughs> yeah. Arch Enemy works. It was a thing for a while. Wizards was promoting it. There were a couple of... Um, did you ever play any of those Duels of the Planeswalkers games that they released for console? Once or twice those? yeah for sure yeah they had arch enemy on one or two of those incarnations i think so they were trying to make it a thing but then it just kind of fell off the map well and actually so so again you know praise be to to our lord and savior gavin verhey like uh the last uh, arch enemy set uh to be designed and released was actually with amonkhet and it was uh, Nicol bolas flavored and so it's 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 actually fairly recent like the original was something like 10 years ago but like it's something that still occasionally just shows up as a as a supplemental product which is exciting for me because it means i could find more evil dastardly things to do to my poor drafters um and subject them <laughs> to my whims but arch enemy for the uninitiated is a alternate uh, constructed play format which originally the sets came with their own decks, but you know I think it's it's more often than not played as like a commander variant, for instance. But it is uh, it is contrived as a three verse one play environment where you have a team of three that I now know and and you do too that um, they are known as the Alliance, and their job is to defeat the fourth player in this pod, who is known as the Arch Enemy. In order to balance gameplay, the Arch Enemy is given a unique deck of cards that is known as uh, the Scheme Deck. How this functions is that uh, at the beginning of the Arch Enemy's uh, first main phase, they flip a scheme off of the top of the Scheme Deck, and that triggers and hits the stack. 
And, you know, there's a whole slew of really terrible things these are these schemes do. And there are ones that are kind of like one shot. They, you know, they do something and they go away. And then there are persistent ones that actually stick around for a while. And until certain criteria is met, uh, they, they don't go away. Like we said, there's been about, I want to say at least two, maybe three. There, there have been three because the original, there was an original, there was a release that was dragon specific. And then the most recent version uh, in conjunction with Amonkhet or that block, at least, uh, there was a Nico Bolas flavored uh, version. And so, you know, it's, it's never really taken off as a format because it inherently is very swingy. You'll get some games where, you know, the arch enemy hits a bunch of duds from the scheme deck and they get steamrolled by three players who just curve up and roll them out. And then you'll have other games where it's like, you know, they, they flip a sequence of schemes and they just utterly ruin the game. And so there's this, there's this high proclivity towards non-games happening, you know, on either side of that, uh, that spectrum. You know, that was one of the considerations for this cube, because like, as we're saying, you know, I've, I've attempted here to design a cube that can foster an arch enemy like experience in a limited environment. Yeah. I mean, I've never heard of anything like this being done before, which is porting the arch enemy play experience to limited. This is, I mean, this is totally novel as, as far as I know. Is that your impression as well? I've had the, the opportunity to talk with uh, a couple folks online who have their takes on uh, an arch enemy like environment, or at least draft environments that incorporate um, like schemes, for instance. Um, so like uh, Brad Bradley Rose is, uh, is one person who comes to mind. He has his own take on it. And so that was the intention here is being like the first that I've heard of that really tries to replicate true to the format, like an arch enemy game using a cube as the foundation arch enemy is three versus one as you're describing do you uh, have you designed the cube for four player draft or eight player draft how does that work ideally you know at least in my eyes this is done as an eight player draft and there's actually a really fun component which was another input as to why i wanted to do this of secret information in terms of being able to know before the draft, you know, which pod you're going to be in of the two four player pods, and then what role you will be. Will you be on the alliance in that game? Or will you be the arch enemy? Again, like this was constructed with the titanic help of, of our dear friend, Dan, I came into this conversation, um, saying like, I miss social interaction. Obviously, we all know because of the post COVID reality we're all living in, like that's that's been kind of the crux of things. And I miss games where the social aspect is front and center. And so that was your mafias. That was your werewolf. That was, you know, any of those games where it's, you know, hidden information, and you're trash talking, and you're trying to ascertain like, who's, you know, who's the person who's going to stab you in the back in this game and trying to like making that like a central aspect. I thought that that would be an interesting way of essentially adding a, a unique element to this cube, but then also from like, like from a practical and a functional standpoint, like a way to split players up when it came time to actually play the games. And so I could read off how this is drafted because I have the, the description up front because that was a big thing to kind of get this set up. Before the draft begins, players secretly learn which of the two four-player pods they will be playing in. Players will also learn whether or not they will be the arch enemy for their pods, or subsequently, on the alliance. Now, the, the, the fun kind of werewolfy kind of Salem aspect we added here was the next step, which was all players then will close their eyes, and after which players will be instructed to open and subsequently close their eyes in the following order. So all of the players in pod one so they know where all four players are seated at the table. Then all players in pod two, so they know where they are. And then last, the arch enemies, so they know where they are sitting at the table. 
And what's fun about this is knowing that of those three other players that you've made eye contact with prior to drafting, one of them is going to be a person who's going to try to f*** your day. And so, like, what happens if you're, like, sitting next to that person and you're feeding them cards? What happens when you have the arch enemies sitting next to each other? Do they find a way to, like, ascertain, like, what they're drafting and try to maximize that in some way, shape, or form? Like, there's just, like, a psychology to it that I think is really funny. Continuing down the list, so then the draft commences in a typical eight-player draft, so left, right, left, or whatever. We're currently playing with um, the number of packs and the number of cards in packs because we want to limit the amount of wheels, um, cards that wheel um, around the table. So we're thinking probably doing like five nine-card packs, so you only get one card on the wheel. So why, why limit the wheels? Well, I think it's just to prioritize your pick in the moment. You know, you pick card A out of your pack and there's such a low likelihood that card B that you really want is going to come back to you on that wheel. It's it's kind of just like trying to see if we can push players to plan less ahead and just be like in that moment for the for their picks. What's the advantage that you see to having people play in the moment, to be drafting in the moment and taking like the card that they need right now and not looking to the future and banking on something coming back? It's a good question. Um, I think for me, it's like, I I want to, you know, I don't really know. (laughs) (laughs) No, sorry. I'm not saying that you're wrong. No, 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 no. I'm trying to put you on the spot, really. No, it's a great question. I'm I'm curious. it's, 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 It's genuinely one of the things where it's like, you know, I think it's I think it's just that psychology of it of just um, by saying like, oh, you know, by giving people less of a chance to like begin to like do the the 40 chess in their head of like, oh, you know, the likelihood of this card wheeling back to me, you know, is strong in a 15 card pack. You know, the likelihood that that is going to be the one card that comes back to you in a nine card pack, you know, forces you to to make more decisions on the, the composition of your cards right now versus you know, how things might flow. Well, you're getting more first picks and more, and consequently more second picks or whatever. You're getting fewer like later picks. You're getting no 14th picks. So your decision tree is that much more constricted, at least on a per pack basis. Mm -hmm. That's true. As I started to explain it, it started to make a little bit more sense in my head. I was like, Ooh, this is, this is a good thought exercise for me to kind of like work my way through this. (laughs) There's another fun aspect to the draft of this cube. After the draft is completed, players are instructed to reveal which pod they're in. So players in pod one, raise your hand. Players in pod two, raise your hand. As well as identifying who the arch enemies are. So if you are the arch enemy for pod one, raise your hand. If you are the arch enemy for pod two, raise your hand. So like all the cards, figuratively speaking, are on the table. Then the arch enemies will get up and they will Rochester draft four packs of 12 from what I call the scheme cube. And so I have devised an alternate cube that goes in conjunction with this, this arch enemy list of 70 scheme cards. And there's uh, it's not singleton. There's uh, there's uh, more of some and less of others because there are some really broken ones that we avoided altogether. And there's some more generic ones, like each player discards a card. They will Rochester. And for those that don't know Rochester, essentially, you know, all the cards are laid down on the table and players alternate their picks back and forth. Um, so there will be full information on what picks are made. Um, so each player will come out with 24 scheme cards. And as part of deck building, they'll cut that scheme deck down to 20. And then players will construct their decks, form their pods, and play their games. And then what's fun about this is like you inherently get two games out of a draft because the arch enemies can switch pods. And so you can play okay, against, interesting. Uh, you know, you can play against what, what they're doing as well. So it's, you know, kind of, kind of fun. You were talking about Rochester drafting the scheme cards, just an, an idea is I wonder if there's some way of introducing the Alliance into the equation as well. I don't know, just as a thing to think about, like give the Alliance an opportunity to periodically have a pick to just to, you know, cut cards or something from the, maybe like to, they pick a bur- they pick a card to burn. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. They get to burn a card periodically. That's interesting. Because I think what's what's interesting, like, again, thinking like 
you know, this is thinking in all hypotheticals. So it's like, there's no, there's no bad ideas right now is like where my head was going is likely because it's a Rochester draft, you know, it's full information. The Alliance teams can, you know, be watching to see what cards their arch enemy is picking. But then I'm, I was also wondering, you know, if like the arch enemies are Rochester drafting and they're kind of bouncing off of each other like what they need to benefit you know what they need to supplement the deck they drafted my guess is that the alliance for the respective pods uh will actually build their decks sitting together and like collaboratively discussing oh i'm gonna do this this and this you should do that and that so that we can interplay you know in these ways in order to like have cross cross deck synergy or cross play synergy to to defeat this player there's you know it's it's going to be a a fascinating uh psychology experiment to see how this plays out and i think that's really like any cube is really like a fun experiment in psychology to see how players you know why and you know it's part of why we like to watch and understand why people do what they do but this one especially because there's going to be so many uh, small mechanics, at least initially, to see like how players respond and what they do as a result. So clearly there are effects in Magic that make sense more for an arch enemy player that are going to, I mean, especially, I suppose, what am I trying to say? Things like balance or whatever. Symmetrical effects are probably going to more benefit the arch enemy, right? If they're impacting in a negative way, three people, that seems good. And there are effects that may benefit the alliance more than the arch enemy in general. So what I'm getting at is this seems like this is a particular challenge to constructing this format because you're trying to balance not only cards that are generically good for anybody, but cards that may particularly shine in one camp or the other. So I wonder if you can talk about some of the challenges that you face there, any sort of particular cards that you found that were especially interesting when deployed for one group or the other. Maybe cards that play in very different ways when the arch enemy has it or when the alliance has it, you know? You know, you you begin to see trends in like the kinds of cards you're picking. And there was like a few heuristics uh, that like, I mean, retroactively, it's, you know, didn't didn't have these in mind when we started. But, you know, once you're able to look, take a step back and look at the, the currently finished product, you could start to see some of like the heuristics that kind of inform like why there are certain picks and certain decisions. There's three, and it's actually funny, I still have this sticky up here. So, you know, scalability is one of them. Finding cards that scale over the course of the game in a way that's strong or interesting. Specialization, having cards that may work more strongly for the Alliance um, or cards that work more strongly specifically for Arch Enemies or cards that work across both. Um, And then the last one, which you hit on, which was symmetry, having cards that affect all players, affect uh, a single player, or as we found, um, finding cards that are variable in nature in terms of being dependent on who's using them. And I think probably one of the most um, important bits of uh, language, your or each opponent. Uh, because an interesting nuance about the alliance is that all those players on that alliance, on that team, uh, are not opponents. Any card that references each opponent on the alliance side will only affect the arch enemy. And conversely, when an arch enemy plays a card that speaks to each opponent, it will equally affect only players on the alliance. And so that was an interesting nuanced way of finding a way to you know give utility or make cards have utility on both sides of the table um so i'm looking at for instance uh, a creature card uh from m21 called Stormcaller. so this is a, a red card this is a ogre shaman a 3-2 ogre shaman for two and a red and it says when Stormcaller enters the battlefield it deals two damage to each opponent and so that basically becomes a 3-2 three, for 3 that shocks the arch enemy, or it's a 3-2 three, for 3 that shocks all of the alliance. You know, another one is uh, Gutter Snipe. 
you know, and some of these cards are going to be cards that are familiar to people, but you don't you don't realize that this language actually um, carries weight um, in these multiplayer environments, or at least asymmetrical. If you play this in a commander game, everybody's your opponent. Uh, whereas if you're playing in a battle bond or a arch enemy environment, there's an asymmetricality to how the game is played. And so, like for for gutter snipe, which folks, is a 2-2 a two, two Goblin Shaman for 3, 2 and a red. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcerer spell, Gutter Snipe deals 2 damage to each opponent. Similarly to Stormcaller, you know, it's a 2-2 two, two that shocks uh, the arch enemy for each instant or sorcerer you play, or it's a 2-2-4-3 two, two, that shocks each member of the Alliance when you cast an instant or sorcerer spell. And it's not only doing two damage versus doing six damage, depending on which side of the table is casting it. But uh, as you described, the uh, life pools for the different uh, sides are different, right? So a shock is a comparatively lower percentage of the 40 life that the arch enemy starts with compared to the 20 life that each member of the alliance starts with. Right. Which actually brings up another tenant of this cube, Um, you know, inherently trying to balance, you know, how things favor the arch enemy versus the alliance. Because like when you look at it with no context, you know, it's a 3v1 play environment and you add in the scheme cube, which is essentially free play actions for the arch enemy that can give them the leg up in this 3v1 game. You know, on one hand, there's trying to balance out the strength of that scheme list so it's not too overwhelming or too consistently overwhelming for the alliance but then how do you in the dra- in the cube and the draft environment itself minimize either the opportunity for the arch enemy to get a leg up or for the alliance to essentially negate the balancing effect the scheme deck has on the game and so that, that brings up actually two tenants. So there isn't a whole lot of classic control. You know, there's there's cards like Delay, Blue Instant for one and a blue. Um, so counters a spell, but when it's countered, it actually removes that spell from the game with three time counters instead of putting it in the owner's graveyard. Basically, then it gains suspense. So it's, you haven't stopped the card, but you've delayed it for a certain period. So, you know, essentially, you don't want, like, one of the alliance to be able to counter the schemes, because that is something you can do. They do hit the stack as a triggered ability, or a triggered effect, and thus can be, you know, they could be stifled. And so the other side of that as well is minimizing the availability of cards that produce free game actions in the draft, An example of that is there are no Planeswalkers in this list. Everything is is spell-based, with the exception, obviously, of the schemes. Yeah, and anybody on the Alliance can block, right, when the Arch Enemy attacks? Yeah, so it's like, you know, there's less incentive, potentially, for the Arch Enemy to attack if one player has, like, an 8-8. You know, the top of the curve for uh, green, for instance, has a couple of 6-6s. Six or, you, you know, <laughs> you have Grothama in this list, which is hysterical, um, just in concept. Groth- Grothama? Grothama is All Devouring is a mythic from Battle Bond. It is a 10-8 for 5. Okay. 3 and 2 green. And it's got some really confusing text on it. Like, I still I still grapple with it. Ten eight worm that reads, Other creatures have, whenever this creature attacks, you may have it fight Grothama all devouring. And then it says, when Grothama leaves the battlefield, each player draws cards equal to the amount of damage dealt to Grothama this turn by sources they <laughs> controlled. Crazy. So basically, everything can fight Grothama, and depending on how much damage you deal it uh, when it dies, you draw that many cards. So it, we haven't gotten into to archetypes too much, but like, so two of the really fun and fascinating uh, archetypes I've put in here, the, the, the archetypes that I put in here specifically for red-white, so Boros, and green-red, or red green in um, Gruul synergize in a way that I think is really interesting, and, and I haven't really seen it in cubes before. Um, you have some classics like green white tokens. You have blue white counters. Um, black green is kind of a graveyard list. 
red black is you know similar to my uh, powered list is kind of a, an aristocrats type build but then you have some 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 wonky ones black blue so demir for instance um is theft so it's um you know stealing things um you know i think uh, probably one of the more expensive cards in the cube now is uh gilded drake um, which kind of falls into this archetype it also falls into the blue white archetype which is a skies list um so you know just capitalizing on flyers um as a means of evasion you know i, I mentioned before gruel and boros as being you know kind of unique um from a archetype experience and so boros is what i've coined as crowd control and so that's damaged based board wipes so like think blasphemous act um or something along those lines um more combat tricks and indestructible creatures Boros Reckoner, Spite Mare, or my my most recent my most recent favorite, um, which which actually won me a couple of Commander games of late, Brazen Taunter. Brazen Taunter. I don't know Brazen Taunter. Oh, it's so it's so good. Um, but it's a uh, it's a one one Goblin for five. So you know we're already knocking this out of the park <laughs> um, on like okay. your classic your cube staple. It's a one one for five, right? Same uh, same converted mana cost as a uh, uh, siege gang commander, but it's uh, it's an indestructible one one goblin, and it reads: whenever brash taunter is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to target opponent, and it has an activated ability for two and a red and tap it. Brash taunter fights another target creature. Oh, sweet! And so you know this guy just sits around and he just takes the hits and you just reflect that damage back to wherever you need it. If it's, uh, if you're the arch enemy, like, you know, this certainly is a, a way to dissuade those big attacks, but he also synergizes with the gruel archetype, which I've lovingly called fight club. And so this is an archetype that capitalizes on the fight mechanic um, and essentially, you want to turn your creatures into removal spells, being able to force non-combat damage through. You have, obviously, like, being able to fight with our dear friend Brash Taunter is, like, one example. But then, like, for instance, like, Growth Fama is, like, a huge thing because it essentially then turns all of your creatures into brawlers. And so, like, if you have Growth Fama and Brash Taunter out and you suddenly swing with Grothama and have your Brash Taunter or an Alliance member's Brash Taunter fight Grothama, you suddenly have 10 damage to throw around. <laughs> it's like, and then you can and then you can activate Brash Taunter again and deal another 10 damage. So it's like <laughs> That's a cool combo for sure. Yeah, like you know, like another one here um in green, um, even though it technically has a, a, it's a gruel inclined because of a split mana cost is uh Naif of the dire hunt legendary human warrior that is a three three for four mana so two and two green and she reads when one or more creatures you control fight or become blocked draw a card uh, so you get card advantage and then at the beginning of combat on your turn you may pay two and uh split gruel so split green red and if you do Double target creature's power until end of turn, and that creature must be blocked this combat if able. So it turns, uh, you know, it has a built-in lure effect. Like another another synergy that gives this fight mechanic, um, this this fight club archetype, you know, gives it card advantage. You know, gives it lure effects. Um, so if you have some big, big, spicy, smashing creatures, like you know, the opportunity to double up and push push through some serious damage especially if it's a trampler like i can't even imagine again like grothama is just like a pet card of mine in this list so i'm just very excited being able to play <laughs> being able to have grothama naith and then somebody having brash taunter like being able to double grothama's power and toughness with naith and then fighting with brash taunter like you're now throwing 20 damage uh, a pop oh my gosh yeah <laughs> it's just like again like i'm i'm hyper focusing in on just like a really funny interaction you know you have other creatures that so spite mare is another one you know and that deals damage to any target you know there's a few of those that kind of just like that really benefit from that which is really funny and so that's kind of like you know you get really you know you get kind of proud and and i think especially like the gold 
portion of this cube strongly um, signals in those colors like what the archetype is. Rakdos the Showstopper is in here. Now, Rakdos the Showstopper, I, I can't imagine that playing in any other cube environment, but that is a, that is a 6-6 six, six demon uh, for 6, so 4 and black and red pips. And he has, fl- he has Flample, so he has Flying and Trample. And when he enters the battlefield, you flip a coin for each creature that isn't a demon, devil, or imp, and you destroy each creature whose coin comes up tails. <laughs> so that's clearly one that is going to most benefit you would imagine the arch enemy just because the opponents taken together are going to have more targets Naeth, you were describing as kind of interesting for being a card that at least as i'm envisioning it is probably better for the alliance because the lure ability just says it must be blocked. It, it doesn't say for example every creature able to block this creature must do so You just have to block it with one thing. And I'm imagining that the Alliance is going to tend to have a fuller board than the Arch enemy is going to. And so the Alliance is going to be better able to chump block well, actually, here's here's a so so a nuance to that is you actually can attack other alliance members. But um, what is interesting about this text is is actually less about the lure effect, but the fact that because you have a shared combat step, that second line of text is really interesting because you don't have to target one of your creatures. The effect is triggering during your combat. Oh, that's sweet. But it's doubling target creatures' powers, so it could be somebody else's. Creature creature that you're doubling so on one hand you're you're increasing damage output but then also let's say for instance the arch enemy only has one creature that creature now its attention is put towards whatever creature is triggered on and so all of the other creatures have the opportunity to swing in and and get some damage that's super cool Are there other cards that you might point out that work particularly well for the Alliance rather than for the Arch Enemy? Cards that work interestingly when you're playing together? In the case of the Alliance, we have a few cards in here that that have assist. And so assist reads... Uh, another player may pay up to uh, the un uh, the uncolored mana for a spell's cost. So, for instance, I'm looking at Out of Bounds, which is a counter spell for three and a blue, and it has assist, which basically means that another player can pay up to the three in that converted mana cost. So the the caster can just pay blue, and if another player has mana available they can essentially pay off the rest of the spell. Oh, that's cool. What about Surge? Do you remember that? Which says something like, if somebody else has cast a spell this turn, then you can pay the Surge cost and it's cheaper. It's 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 in the consideration set. I don't think we we have any that that made it in here thus far. There are there are cards that care about um, number of cards drawn or number of spells. Like, for instance, um, Kraum, Ludovic's Opus, is in here, which you know has art done by a good friend of mine, Aaron Miller, who's actually helping me on a, a secret uh, a secret component of this cube, which, which I will unveil in due time, but I'm very excited about it. Okay, awesome. But it is a, uh, Kraum is a legendary zombie horror um, that is a 4-4 four, four for 5, so 3 in blue-red. Um, he is flying in haste, uh, and whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. So it's a, a an interesting draw engine that um, that preys upon players casting multiple spells. And it stacks because it's an opponent. So if all three of the Alliance play two spells, the arch enemy will trigger and draw three guards. Okay, well, <laughs> but if each of them plays one spell, it wouldn't trigger. Right, it's, it has to be true? an opponent, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Um, let's see, let's see. We also currently have some cards that are a bit more flavored towards the arch enemy, and those are cards that leverage the commander mechanic Undaunted. And so Undaunted reads, this spell costs one generic mana less to cast for each opponent. Um, so if you have more opponents, it costs less. Um, so for instance, uh, Sublime Exhalation is a sorcery for seven, so six and a white, um, and it has Undaunted, so it can cost one less for each opponent you have, and it's basically a Wrath of God. It just destroy all creatures. 
if you have three opponents, it costs three less. So it actually costs white and three. You know, and the rate is not terrible for uh, you know the team, the, the the alliance as well, because it'll be five and one. But you know, like you had mentioned before, the likelihood that a alliance member is going to cast a board wipe is significantly less than the arch enemy anyways so why give them a better you know day of judgment just for full disclosure is in here as well but like this is a card that certainly benefits the arch enemy more and has a bit of tension to it because as you knock out opponents it costs more i think a a card i don't know who it's going to benefit but it really is i think one of the cornerstones for the creation of this cube it is an uncard Um, that I got very excited about because once you start going through the thought exercise, it's really fun. But that is better than one. And so this is a Selesnia card. Um, It's a sorcery for a green and a white. And it reads, a person outside the game becomes your teammate. Choose any number of cards in your hand, on top of your library, or on the battlefield under your control. Those cards become your teammate's hand and library and permanence, respectively. But what I thought was really funny about this card was the fact that if I'm not playing, someone can conscript me into a game to play. Or what I think would be even splashier is the dream play of the arch enemy knocking out a alliance member and then casting this and immediately conscripting them as essentially a second arch enemy in that game. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> then all of a sudden it's two on two. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. That just really upends the game. Yeah, and then it's like, you know, that that could be it could be a situation where somebody gets knocked out of the pod A and somebody casts this in pod B and pulls that player over, you know? I think the it's it's funny because it was one of the last cards I was able to acquire for this just because it's so hard to find. Um, is actually uh, another I don't know if it's an uncard, but it's a, it's certainly a promo. It's in the Orzov list and it is naughty nice. And this is uh, one of the holiday cards. This was actually for uh, holiday 2012. This one is really funny because it's a uh, split card um, and it's either one and two black for naughty and one and two white for nice Um, naughty reads and they're both sorceries um, naughty reads search another target player's library for a card and put that card into your hand then shuffle that player's library so you're actually going in and stealing a card from another player's deck yeah it's like a bribery kind of thing yep and conversely nice is a white sorcery uh, that reads, search your library for a card and put it into another target player's hand, then shuffle your library. So this is the opposite of it where it's like, hey, you know, I could really use a ramp spell. I could really use this effect. And so you can actually give that player that card by tutoring this up. (laughs) This is the kind of stuff where it's just like creating these wild stories and scenarios that are are unique to this format i think if i was to call it one more card and it's kind of a meme but i'm also very hopeful that somebody will actually draft it play it and perhaps win with it is good old triskaidekaphobia oh yeah (laughs) that's a cool card yeah so that's a that's a four mana black enchantment three and a black and it reads at the beginning of your upkeep choose one there's two options each player with exactly 13 life loses the game then each player gains one life or each player with exactly 13 life loses the game then each player loses one life and uh so orzov black white in here is very strongly built into a a life-based mechanic so it's it's a like life gain or life loss you know draining players and stuff like that you know i could see this is just like sure it's it's just funny because it's in here but like it could be a, a potential win condition for someone who's able to sculpt a player's life totals there's, there's also some interesting synergy with some of the other cards because it's symmetrical. So each player uh, gaining or losing a life. You have cards in here like um, like Vito, Thorn of the Dusk Rose from M21, um, which reads like the first line of text um, is whenever you gain life, 
target opponent loses that much life. So you can elect for, you know, and again, it's a super incremental thing, but like you can elect to gain life and then essentially negate one player's life gain in that scenario. Yeah, that guy's like, what, Sanguine Bond or something? Or is it the other one? There's two. Yeah, the two that, that kind of glass cannon come together to, to form the infinite. Um, there's braids in here, so there is a there is an opportunity for, for the much beloved and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> stacks archetype to kind of make its way through. I, I don't know if it'll really work its way out in here, but, uh, you know, we'll see. Yeah, well, that's a good evil card, arch enemy kind of card, because it seems like I don't know if you're if you're playing arch enemy, you kind of want to lean into the madness of it. I mean, the schemes. The whole point of the schemes is they're these, at least the way that they're named and the way that they're styled. the The whole point of this is that they're so over the top, evil villain from some B rated movie. <laughs> You know, yeah. all your plans have turned to dust or now I shall cast my shadow upon you. <laughs> I'm just making stuff up. But anyway, you kind of want to lean into that, right? It seems to be. Oh, yeah. You want to be, you wanna be a, you know, a dastardly villain. And like it's it, like what, like I was talking about before about like setting setting expectations through preconceived notions. So like if you're coming to draft with me, you better expect you're going to have a wild and crazy time. Like, I'm just kind of saying, you know, I'm just kind of making that up. But like, you know, for instance, like I have people who are, you know, they're both like, A, I'm really excited to play this cube. And B, I'm really excited to be the arch enemy because X, Y, Z. People that are buying into the hype of, you know, essentially being that villain. It's funny because JJ and I uh, spoke about this cube at length um, on his, on his, uh, uh, on his Twitch stream, you know, about two, three months ago. Yeah. And, you know, we, we went through a draft and like, you know, kind of at least like talking through like pick selection, going through the draft as both an Alliance member and going through the draft as an arch enemy is really interesting because your thought process on what you think you need changes. And when you look at the results of those two drafts, for the Alliance, you know, he drafted a pretty perfect uh, Simic counters list. And then when when he went and drafted as the Arch Enemy, you know, he drafted a much more kind of toolboxy, like utility Mardu list. So black, red, and white. And like board wipes, you know, creatures that maximize damage output, like non-combat damage output, essentially trying to control the board. So it was it was very interesting to see like how uh, the psychology of the draft changed depending on like the needs of the player in that instance. And in this instance, it was the same player just drafting twice. And I think that's what's going to really play out when we when we get to actually drafting this in paper, which I'm happy to say that this is uh, now 100% owned in paper, which is cool. Nice. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I know you'd been working for a while to collect all of these components. Many of them are rather esoteric. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, like they're not uh, only the, obscure in the in the, yeah, in the greatest not only term. the schemes, but also some desirable, rare commodities like naughty and nice, as you were describing before. So yeah. that's super cool. Congratulations on getting that totally assembled. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that was... Uh... Well, this is a super cool project. I, you need some awesome something to put it in. You need like a Necronomicon or something as a storage box for your Arch Enemy Cube. <laughs> I don't know what you know. I'm I'm looking forward, and we've we've discussed this CubeCon when it's uh, officially back up and running. It will certainly be making a an appearance there. Yes, to the delight and nice. chagrin of many. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, that'll be exciting. We're getting there. One of these one of these days, we're going to be able to run KubeCon. Darn it! It was just so depressing to have. I mean, we were we were all so excited about this thing, and we'd put in so much work developing it, and then to just have the rug pulled out from underneath us. Maybe you know, maybe it's fortuitous. Maybe it's given Gavin enough time to come up with a, a KubeCon promo Mishra that uh, he can give out at the event yeah. um, while I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's I love good. him. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Andrew. This has been a lot of fun. 
I appreciate you coming and hanging out. Yes. I look forward to speaking to you more about this on the internets. And of course, if you or, or anybody on the internets uh, wants to have a look at these and, and give some some initial feedback or some, you know, ask questions or just, you know, I'm more than happy to do it. Because again, like, you know, especially for the Arch Enemy Cube, definitely down to, to discuss, you know, the logic and the thinking for some of this to, to better the ultimate experience once people actually get to sit down and draft it. Okay, sweet. Yeah, we'll give Andrew some feedback. Try drafting it. Where's the best place for people to reach you, Andrew? Oh, uh, slide into my DMs on Twitter, y'all. Like, you know, it's uh, it's at Andrew McGreeny. It's right there for for everyone. So uh, hit me up there, um, and then I'll probably I'll probably see a few few folks uh, in the various cube related or magic related discords online. You know, uh, tend to make a lot of noise on there as well. But uh, nothing else. Uh, Twitter Twitter would be the way to go. 